Depending on a 32K flash device, you're much more limited. Do you need to decode these things? Are you like just playing audio back? Are you recording audio? Um, what kind of latency is allowed? What I mean by that is how long do you have between D, you know, getting the data in and showing it on your screen or playing the audio? The more complicated formats often require you to you know, do a lot more work, so you have more time between getting the data and sending it out. Question about licensing, um, patent costs. For the most part, avoid things with patents. That's my advice to you. I'll bring it up several times. Patents are complicated. I don't love them, but I understand why they're there, and yeah, so I'm gonna try to highlight some things where that's not gonna be a problem. And then finally, are the formats supported using tools you can get off the shelf? Um, you know, there, anyone can edit a JPEG or a PNG file or an MP3 audio file. You have some obscure format that you invented to be able to optimize things for a processor, well then you're gonna have to come up with tooling. So let's jump right in. I'm gonna start talking about audio first. Audio, we all love audio, we love making things go beep and boop and sometimes play much longer songs. So when it comes to audio, again, there's some kind of questions. There's all these different parameters that you can kind of figure out what you're gonna do with. Bit rate is a big one. How much data are you pushing through? How many samples a second? Um, the sample size, you know, sometimes if you can go to a smaller sample size, you can fit a lot more audio in. How many channels are you dealing with? Monochrome, one channel, stereo, two. Um, something like surround sound, six, 10, 15 channels. So, and then, you know, how large audio you're gonna have to deal with? Does it have metadata? What I'm talking about there are things like ID3 tags. Like if you're building a podcast player, you're gonna wanna be able to pull out the title and maybe the show JPEG out of that to show. Is it gonna be complicated for you to decode? You know, again, how much software do you have to put in there to turn the raw data into the output you're getting? And, you know, another big question, does your hardware directly support this? This is less of an issue these days on audio side than it is on the video side, but when I come to the next format, I'll um, clarify. So there's a whole range of choices. I mean, I've just listed some of the most popular audio formats here. Of course, you have your standard PCM audio, your WAV file. This is just raw samples, one after the other. Um, this is great, I mean, this is kind of what you want to use when you're editing the audio, but eventually, unless you have unlimited storage space, you're gonna to have to convert it to another form. I mentioned this A-Law and U-Law here because it's a format you might not know about unless you were like working on Sun workstations in the 1990s. <coughs> um, but what they did is they said, okay, we wanna fit audio into 8-bit samples, but we want the, the range of the audio to be higher. So why don't we do a transformation on all the audio samples or put them in a logarithmic curve so you have like kind of where your voice frequencies are more but towards the edges less. So, you know, if you're trying to fit something in eight bits, these are some good algorithms to look up. MP3 I'll be diving into in more detail in a moment. AAC is another format which I really like, but it still has some patent issues. Um, this is something Apple really pushed when they came out with the original iPod. And you think a format that old shouldn't have a problem, but it uh, seems like there's some people asserting some late patents on it these days. Dolby Digital. I am not allowed to say anything about Dolby Digital. No, I'm kidding, but uh, Dolby Digital is a format that is used in lots of broadcasts, lots of um, media delivery systems. Dolby really, really loves their license fees. Um, Vorbis is a format that kind of the open source community came up with in the 90s. Um, if you remember like long threads on Slashdot where people sing MP3, no, Og Vorbis. Well, that's where this came from and it's, it's great. The, you tend not to see as many optimized versions of it these days. And then Opus I'll talk a bit more about. <clears throat> so MP3, we all love it. It's kind of the most common audio file format ever. The good news is that MP3 is patent free. So go ahead, jump on it. It can go down to some pretty low bit rates. Um, you know, you may not want to listen to a 32K MP3, but if you're playing it on a tiny speaker on a box that's gonna be five feet away from someone, you'll probably get away with it. There's a lots of choices on software for decoding this. And <clears throat> while you may look around and find some hardware solutions, um, there's this you know, VS1053B chip that Adafruit sells. These hardware solutions were a lot easier to justify 15 years ago than they are now. That sells for like $12 in a development board, whereas your Pico is $4, and 
you can just do it in software now. Um, the tooling I want to talk about here is something that's a great thing to put in your toolbox. It's this library called LibHelix. So it came out of a project that Real Player did in the late 90s called Helix, which is kind of a whole audio streaming framework. And they decided to release the software as an open source. What's nice about it is they've done an integer version of this, so you can fit it into a pretty small amount of code space. Uh, when I was testing about 20K of code, <coughs> and you know, you doesn't need a huge amount of RAM. I mean, 32K is a lot, but if you're just playing audio, you can afford that. Now, you don't always necessarily, like Opus is a good format for speech. It's a great open source royalty-free format. Um, this was designed especially for speech, and like a lot of devices right now, you might be using a smart speakers, those kind of things, are using it not just for playing back speech, but also for encoding it and sending it back. So good for two-way communications. There's a really great library for it, LibOpus, that's maintained by the people that came up with the format. And you know, if you're including encode and decode, you're gonna get about 200K worth of executable. So you know, I don't know if there's an easy option to strip it to be decode only. I haven't played with it that much, but I like Opus. Okay, so on the road to video, first we gotta deal with images because what is video but a bunch of images in a row? <coughs> so there's a countless number of image formats, images, you know, all of us playing with our badges for badge hacking this week are probably dealing with images in some form. Um, you have something like kind of the older formats like bitmap, targa, which are just raw memory dumps effectively. You know, open file, copy memory, close. <coughs> um, Tile-based formats are something you might find useful. Um, I've been using them some on some of the Arduboy programming I've done. And, you know, if you go back to like the old 8-bit computers, they often had a tile-based system so that like screen memory would be 40 characters across, 24 characters down. But each of those characters was a pointer to another bitmap. And so you can kind of fill up a lot of space with repeated patterns using tiles. These days, the hardware doesn't tend to support it directly, but you know, you can implement it in software pretty easily. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about RLE compression because I really like that for some problems. Um, then you have your dictionary-based compression. These are things you're using like the LZ77, the gzip algorithms, your GIFs and your PNGs. There's DCT-based compression, uh, discrete cosine transfer, if I remember what that is, JPEG. Um, you have a bunch of image files, formats like WebP and AVIF that are based on video codecs. When you encode video, you have to sometimes encode like a full frame of that picture with, um, you know, without any references to other ones. It's what's called iframes, I'll get into that more, but the people said, hey, if we have to do this with a video, let's use it for images as well, and came up with these formats. Problem is you hit the same issues, like a lot of complexity to decode this, and so on a small embedded device, not really worth it yet. Um, considerations, obviously the big thing is how much memory does the encoded form take, how small you're gonna get, but that, the smaller you get the encoded form, the more complexity you have to decode it. So sometimes you're, you know, if you're dealing with a small screen and lots of images, maybe you just wanna do something simple. <coughs> Another thing is compatibility with display hardware. Um, some of these images formats decode to something that's not RGB, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, this RGB versus YUV. Um, is every pixel coming out of that as a direct color value, or is it an index into something else? Um, <coughs> All these things, planar versus interleave, required width height, alpha support, and patent encumbrance. Let's just skip through to get to some fun dives here. So I'm going to talk about a project I did uh, for the Arduboy, um, which was using both RLE and index color. So RLE stands for run length encoding. And <coughs> the idea there is that when you're decoding your image, instead of just saying pixel, 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 you say, oh, here's a color, here's how many of these I have in the row. And so you just say, like, you encode runs of pixels instead of individual ones. So when you're decoding, it's really simple to just see those run length codes and then draw a bunch of pixels in a row. Um, so good on devices where you don't have a lot of code space. Index color is a technique where, you know, instead of having, you know, a t you know each pixel being a direct reference to a color, you have it being a reference to a table of colors, often called a palette, and then you can draw that you know, individual, you look up in the palette table to find out what color goes on the screen. 
So it's doing this coloring book app for the Ardeer Boy. If you haven't seen the Ardeer Boy, it's a little um, Atmega U32 device with a 128 by 64 black and white OLED screen. So you're seeing a coloring book on a black and white screen? Come on. <laughs> well, what I was doing here was I was trying to make a screen that was like twice as wide, twice as high as what you could put on there. And I wanted each of those individual sections to be something you could turn on or off. So you can like go through and try to pick out which parts of the screen fit your picture until you got it to actually match up with what you're trying to build. So I built this custom format. It was already compressed. And whenever I drew the picture, I was actually decoding this from flash, pulling in each row, and based on the table, deciding whether that particular index color was going to be black or white. That let me do a lot of things like, you see in this picture, like I have every di different color in every single region. So if you click your mouse or your cursor on that region, I just go and change the index table to say, oh, well, that one's white now or black now. And this let me reduce the uh, image size, which it was going to be like 32K of data before RLE compression. And, you know, RLE brought, brought it down to half size. I was able to fit into the flash space and get something going. So a format you might want to look at, really good tool support is PNG. Um, the reason why I want to bring this up is I wanted to highlight two tools about PNG. Um, first, <coughs> if you're doing anything, OptiPNG is your friend. It is a command line tool that will take a PNG image and then go and do its magic behind the scenes to try to make it as small as possible. Often what it's doing is like going and taking a direct color bitmap and converting it to an index color bitmap because you notice you're, you're like only using 64 colors. But you know, it can also pull out chunks that you don't need, headers you're not going to need. It's a great thing to have in your library. Um, when it comes to showing PNGs in a device, I mean, PNG was kind of built for the web. It was built for desktop computers, so it's not very optimized for small devices, but Larry Banks, amazing programmer, came up with this library called PNG Deck. And it allows you to do line-by-line -line decoding of PNG files, which is great for if you're basically decoding it and sending it straight out to a TFT display, because you don't need to put the entire bitmap into memory at a time. It does use about 48K of RAM. A lot of that is building up that dictionary because the compression method used in PNG refers to like basically it like, as it comes up with chunks of the image, it saves them into dictionary so it can refer back to them. And so you have to have some memory to kind of put some data so you can continue your decompression. But great tool to have. Um, I'm not going to talk about JPEG too much, except that Larry also did a similar JPEG decoder. Uh, what I really like about this one is that it was optimized for e-paper displays, so it has a built-in option for doing Floyd Steinberg dithering. And I just love, you know, this kind of taking a full-color picture of a squirrel here and getting it something that looks pretty nice on the, the black and white display here. Um, what I noticed actually in doing badge hacking last night, there's also a tiny JPEG library, which is what MicroPython has built into it for display. And that also looks to be pretty useful. I haven't touched it too much yet, but another thing to check into. Now, JPEG is one of those formats that has a weird color space. It's not a weird color space, it's just a different one. And it is outputting the data in what's format called YUV. So think of a typical display. You have red, green, blue elements on there. YUV goes and says, hey, the most important thing for your eyes is the brightness, the Y, the Luma. These other colors, you, you, know, you need them, but we don't have to save, as, we don't have to encode them as as much data. This kind of comes off of like early NTSC pro, uh, television. It was just black and white. And then they added a chroma signal on top of it, but they didn't have as much bandwidth for the chroma. And they said, you know what? People don't mind the colors not being always dead on. So, and that thinking has continued on. We use YUV and JPEG. YUV is used in kind of all the different video formats. Um, and what I have here, kind of an example of this chroma subsampling, this idea that you can represent the color in a much lower resolution than you can represent the brightness and still get an acceptable image. Highlighting here, there's a library that the Chromium team did called LibYUV that's a good thing to have in your arsenal if you need to do this kind of quick conversion because they've gone and they optimized it for ARM, lots of different other processors because it's just so essential. 
And you know, if you're on something with a GPU, you can often get a shader to do this for you, but we're not having GPUs these days. <coughs> so now we get to video. There's a lot of different video formats. Um, I recently saw a great Hackaday article about someone that was driving an e-paper display using motion JPEG images. Motion JPEG was basically this early video format used a lot in editing, and it's just a sequence of JPEGs. Each image is individual, and you, but it's nice that you can decode it and you do like frame by frame cutting and not have to worry about differences. Then you get into MPEG-1, MPEG-2. These are kind of the early video formats that were starting to be released in the early 90s. Um, MPEG-1 I'll dive into more later. You get to more modern things. H.264 is still like the most common video format out there. And a lot of hardware has direct access or direct support for this, like built-in hardware blocks to do decoding. However, H.264 is still very patent encumbered. And if you're shipping a hardware device that has it, you're going to have to figure out you know, some way to pay the license pool. You get into HEVC, H.265. That's the 4K video format. That's that's even more expensive. You're talking about dollars per device, so um, not, not so great. Then we have these kind of more open sourcey or at least open license formats, the VP8, the VP9, and AV1. So VP8, VP9 were all pushed by Google. Uh, they use it actually pretty extensively with YouTube. And they tried to avoid some of the patent holes that H.264 had, not entirely successfully. AV1 is a little industry's like big new format that they're trying to get everyone to adopt. It's great, it has very good compression levels. Even though all the big players are licensing it you know, in a royalty-free manner, there's other players out there that are asserting patents. So even AV1 is not all in the free and clear depending on which lawyers you talk to. And the, you, know, you need a beefy CPU to decode it or you need hardware support. So not something we're gonna do on a Pico these days. In thinking about video formats, one thing you need to think about is like video decoding takes up a whole lot more memory than symbol image decoding. There's this idea of something called a reference frame. So I have here these kind of different kinds of frames, but whenever you decode video, you're gonna to have to keep around several copies of the video buffer in memory so that you can reference them as you decode the new frames. Uh, even like MPEG-1 really requires at least three video frames worth of data to be able to do full decoding. When people are talking about these codecs, they have things called I-frames, P-frames, B-frames. The I-frame are your image frames. Those are the ones that have like a full copy of the image that you can just decode and have immediately in memory. The P-frames are what are prediction frames. These are ones that take a previously decoded frame and say, well, this block is the same as the previous one. Great, this block comes from a little bit further over in the other one, great. And you know, you're able to do a lot of data reduction by referring to previous ones. Then you have the B-frames, the bi-directional. This is where you do get to do some fortune telling because the bi-directional frame is referencing both the past and the future, which means that in the actual video codex, you're sending these frames out of order of how they're being presented. And you know, B-frames are a lot of fun and you know, sometimes people just avoid creating them because it's harder and harder to decode them. MPEG-1 is a format I'm really liking these days. It was invented to deliver video on CDs in the 90s. Never really took off here in the US, but in Asia, it was big times because you could build really cheap hardware and making CDs was a solved problem. Um, MPEG-2 was built on top of it. We're still using MPEG-2 today in broadcast television. You have an ATSC-10 TV, which is pretty much everything out there right now. It is downloading MPEG-2 video over the air and showing it to you on the screen. DVDs use MPEG-2. Um, you know, it's, it's a good high bitrate format, but we come to MPEG-1. I love it because it's patent free. Basically, all the patents on it ran out about 2008. No one's asserting anything. And the other reason I love it is that there's a great library called PLMPEG. It is a single C header file that you can include, and it's got a very maker-friendly format. You basically give it an array of MPEG-1 data, you tell it to process a frame, it gives you out a frame with the Y data, the U data, and the V data, all as individual frames you can go through and then output to your screen. 
I just you know, started using this a few weeks ago, and I built this project called Badger Movie that I can show you later if you find me, where I'm doing MPEG-1 decoding to a e-paper display. Now, this kind of gets, it bypasses some of the slowness of the Pico because it's, the e-paper can only refresh so quickly. So I'm able to decode fast enough to hit the e-paper as quickly as it can refresh. Um, however, you need to start watching it quickly because that e-paper display just doesn't like all those refreshes. And after about 30 seconds, it's kind of a washed out mess. So, but it does work. Final thing I'm talking about is synchronization. Synchronization is a hard problem. So I, synchronization is how do you keep things in time? Like if you're doing video decoding, well, are you decoding fast enough to be able to keep up with audio decoding? Or, you know, just keeping all these different streams up together is a problem. Um, one thing is that most of the video container formats out there have something called a PTS, a presentation timestamp. And this is a value, usually it's set on a 90 kilohertz clock. But the idea is that as you decode frames, they have a PTS associated with them. And then you can use that to adjust your audio. Um, you can like play some samples slower, play them, play them faster, or you can delay showing video, just so you can keep everything lined up. Uh, if you're doing something that's gonna require some heavy synchronization, there's good frameworks like GStreamer out there to help you. If you're doing it on your own, well, you're, you're gearing for a lot of fun. Um, and clock rollover is just something to mention. This is something I hit with doing broadcast television. Uh, you know, that 90 hertz clock rolls over sometime like a day and a half or so. And if you don't deal with that correctly, you get really fun artifacts. Um, now, you don't always necessarily need to keep audio and video synchronized. Sometimes you're doing something like synchronizing closed captions. Sometimes you're trying to synchronize animations. I did a project a couple of years ago called Daft Punk Ward Clock. The idea was taking the song harder, faster, better, stronger. It only has like 17 or maybe 20 words in it. So we could put all those words here into a word clock and then highlight them as the audio played. It was fun. So in order to do this, I was going through, like sitting in Audacity, marking everything, like whenever there's a new line said, figuring out which words were in that line, coming up with this whole presentation format. And then when I started playing, it's like, yay, yay, oh no, no, because it kept getting out of sync more and more time. I ended up having to go into CircuitPython and make modifications to the MP3 decoder logic there to expose the number of frames of audio that had been decoded. That way I could do my presentation clock for my animations based upon how much data had actually been processed, not upon some real-time clock that had drifted, you know, because it was on a battery and not very good hardware. And, you know, the kind of lesson there is that the user may not notice that something is going a little slower, a little fast, but if all possible, use that actual playback speed as a reference for things you're doing instead of the clock on the wall. So that's, that's my talk. Uh, thank you all for paying attention. I'm gonna be around here working on badges stuff and happy to demo any of those projects for you. Um, I'm available online, and including the very weirdly written Mastodon, so <laughs> sorry about that. And I also want to acknowledge some common Creative Commons images and links. Y'all have this presentation online to refer to for anyone. So thank you all very much. <laughs>